El meteorito ha cambiado de color y me di cuenta que destruye todo lo que es planta. No se puede acercar a una planta porque la mata. Miren ustedes. Y cuando uno le pone algo con vida, por ejemplo esta hoja. No le pone algo con vida. Ustedes pueden ver cómo ella transmite como una fuerza totalmente raro Mira. y no creen en el meteorito yo quisiera que vinieran rápido a investigar este tipo de de piedra no sé de, de dónde vendrá de de qué galaxia Totalmente a lo que es orgánico, como que lo destruye, pero cuando tú lo agarras, no quema, eso es lo extraño. No sé si estará haciéndome daño en mi mano, pero al, al, al mí no me hace nada. Pero a las hojas, puedes ver, mira cómo ha quedado esto. Welcome to the debate. Today, we're diving into, well, a really fascinating and, uh, frankly, viral story coming out of Panama. It concerns a man's claim of finding an alien-like entity uh, growing on a meteorite. Now, this isn't just some, you know, curious anecdote. It really touches on fundamental questions about how we interpret unusual biological findings, especially when they intersect with objects from, well, beyond Earth. So our central question today is, does this reported phenomenon actually point towards extraterrestrial life? Or is there a more robust, uh, let's say, terrestrial scientific explanation? I'll be arguing for that terrestrial explanation, rooting it firmly in known biology and um, established scientific principles. And I'll be exploring why, despite Yes, a pretty compelling history of misinterpretations and, frankly, outright hoaxes in these kinds of claims. The unique circumstances here might warrant a, a deeper look at alternative possibilities. It really comes down to how rigorously we approach things when there's an undeniable extraterrestrial component involved right from the start. Okay, so this claim from Panama, this alien-like entity on a meteorite, while it's definitely captured the public imagination and you can see why it is, in my view, part of a, mm, a very consistent pattern. We see unusual findings, they get sensationalized, and then they ultimately turn out to be terrestrial or sometimes, yeah, just fabrications. We've seen this play out so many times. Uh, think about Past examples that got a lot of attention, like that metallic UFO sphere found in Colombia, stirred up a lot of debate, right? But ultimately, no solid proof of anything extraterrestrial came out of it. Or maybe even more telling, those uh, alien mummies from Peru, extensively debunked. Turned out they were just, well, cleverly made dolls using animal bits, human bones, plant fibers. It shows this recurring theme this tendency towards, let's call it, misinterpretation, maybe sensationalism. And it highlights why we need scientific rigor, uh, a healthy dose of skepticism, when these things first pop up. <laughs> so in this specific case, the growth on the Panama meteorite, I think it can be quite strongly explained by something pretty amazing in biology, radiotrophic fungi. Now, these aren't your you know, common mushrooms. These things actively grow towards radiation sources. They even seem to use radiation, potentially as an energy pathway. Scientists call it radiotrophism. It's, it's genuinely remarkable. We've seen this studied extensively, famously around Chernobyl, right? Fungal colonies there have adapted, thrived even, in incredibly radioactive zones. They even use melanin, the pigment, uh, to potentially convert gamma radiation into chemical energy. So a meteorite, depending on what it's made of, and its trip through space, which is full of radiation, could easily provide a localized radioactive spot, perfect for this kind of extremophile growth. That makes a natural, 
earth-based explanation far more likely, far more scientifically sound than jumping to aliens. And these descriptions, alien-like, venom-like, well, they're highly subjective, aren't they? It seems like an interpretation of just an unusual but totally natural fungal shape adapting to its little niche environment. Okay, look, I absolutely acknowledge the pattern you're talking about. The hoaxes, the misinterpretations, they're real. And things like the metallic sphere or those um, Peruvian mummies made from animal and human parts, they are definitely potent reminders of, well, how easily people can be misled or maybe want to believe. But I approach this specific case a bit differently. The context here is, I think, absolutely crucial. The reported growth is on an actual meteorite, an object that is by definition undeniably from space, extraterrestrial origin. That foundational element, this non-terrestrial substrate, the material it's growing on, it introduces a really unique variable. It fundamentally sets it apart from claims about weird stuff found on Earth or things like those Peruvian dolls that were entirely fabricated from Earth materials. This isn't just another unidentified blob. It's an extraterrestrial rock showing weird biological activity. Hmm. And while, yes, radiotrophic fungi are fascinating and a scientifically plausible explanation, I'm certainly not dismissing it out of hand. The description itself gives me pause. An alien-like entity that looks like venom that reportedly sparked widespread speculation and fear. That suggests something visually distinct, right? A morphology, a shape that maybe doesn't quite fit our usual picture of fungus, even the weird ones. So while a terrestrial answer is possible, maybe even probable, the fact that the host object is from space, combined with these vivid descriptions that immediately screamed alien to people, well, it means we should be careful about shutting the door on other possibilities too quickly. We need real definitive scientific analysis before we categorize it. Ignoring the unique nature of the substrate, the meteorite itself, feels like overlooking a critical piece of the puzzle. And maybe, just maybe, missing a chance for a genuinely new discovery. I understand the point about the meteorite being, you know, extraterrestrial, and yes, it adds that initial layer of intrigue. Of course it does. However, that consistent history, the debunked claims like the Peruvian mummies, the dolls made from bone and fiber, that creates such a strong precedent, we really can't just brush it aside. This history clearly demonstrates the public's uh, inherent tendency towards speculation, maybe even fear, when faced with any unusual phenomenon especially if it hints at extraterrestrial life. So when initial viral claims like this Panama meteorite thing surface, they absolutely should be met with significant skepticism. That's just good scientific practice. Extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence, right? Our first, most rigorous approach has to be through that terrestrial lens, looking for known science first before we leap to conclusions that are frankly, potentially far-fetched. There's also that psychological bias, pareidolia, seeing patterns or life in ambiguous shapes. We have to actively guard against that. But I'm not convinced that line of reasoning fully applies here, because it seems to conflate the nature of the claim, which might be prone to sensationalism, with the nature of the object itself. While human error, hoaxes, sensationalism, they're definitely factors in many, many reports. The core object here is, again, undeniably a meteorite, material from space. That's fundamentally different from a manufactured doll or some unidentified sphere found in a field. The extraterrestrial origin of the substrate, the rock it's growing on, it just fundamentally alters the baseline for investigation. It's not just another UAP. It's a cosmic artifact showing biological activity. Even if that activity turns out to be familiar Earth life, the fact that it's happening on something from space warrants a more nuanced approach from the get-go, not just an immediate dismissal based on past human mistakes with entirely different kinds of objects. Think about NASA's protocols for sample return, right? Extreme quarantine. Why? Because even a terrestrial microbe found on a Mars rock would be huge news with massive implications. Now, obviously, this Panama meteorite isn't a pristine sample return, but the principle holds the material's origin demands a distinct level of scrutiny. We can't just lump it in with earthly hoaxes. 
we have to ask, seriously, what if? Okay, let's pivot to the mechanism then, beyond just the history. What known terrestrial phenomena could actually explain this? Radiotrophic fungi, as I mentioned, they thrive near Chernobyl. They show clear radiotropism. They offer a really robust scientific fit for growth in conditions potentially found on a meteorite, especially considering radiation exposure in space and potential radioactive elements within the rock itself. We know these fungi can handle, even utilize, radiation levels far beyond what most life can tolerate. They don't just survive radiation. They seem to interact with it metabolically. Now, this description, venom-like, well, as I said, it strikes me as highly subjective and pretty culturally loaded, right? Comparing something weird to a comic book character? We do this all the time. Humans anthropomorphize. We sensationalize unusual natural forms. It's like seeing faces in clouds or calling deep-sea fish alien-looking. Given that we know radiotrophic fungi can develop unusual shapes, weird morphologies, in response to extreme environments, complex mats, strange elements, it seems perfectly plausible that an atypical fungal structure growing on a potentially radioactive rock would get slapped with a dramatic label like venom-like by the public. The visual distinctiveness, I argue, can likely be explained by unique environmental pressures causing morphological adaptation without needing to bring in anything truly alien. That's a fair point about the adaptability of fungi, and yes, cultural perception absolutely plays a role. But I have to push back slightly. Are we certain that the specific visual impact, the thing that made people immediately jump to venom and sparked reportedly widespread speculation and fear, truly aligns with known fungal forms? Even the really weird ones. Subjectivity is one thing, sure, but the consistency and strength of that alien reaction suggests something visually striking, maybe profoundly unusual. It wasn't just called weird mold. It was given this very specific, evocative label, implying something non-biological or non-terrestrial, at least in its appearance. While earth fungi are incredibly diverse, glowing mushrooms, slime molds that navigate mazes, all sorts of bizarre stuff, the combination here is key. An extraterrestrial host object, plus a description evoking such a potent alien image. That combo demands, I think, a really careful morphological analysis. We need to be sure we aren't just quickly slotting something potentially novel, even if ultimately terrestrial, into a familiar box. Or worse, overlooking something truly extraordinary just because it doesn't look like fungus we've cataloged before. What exactly was it about the growth that screamed venom? Was it the texture? The color? Did it appear to move? Those details matter. Well, looking at it through the lens of radiotrophic fungi actually deepens our understanding of life right here on Earth, particularly extremophiles. It reinforces a key idea that life, even under conditions like intense radiation that would kill most things, often follows understandable biological rules. This case, assuming it resolves as fungal growth, becomes a powerful illustration of terrestrial biology's resilience. It highlights why using Earth analogies is so important and how far known science can take us in explaining seemingly bizarre events. And by doing that, it helps set a much more rigorous, informed standard for evaluating any future claims of actual extraterrestrial life. So rather than being some unique anomaly pushing us towards aliens, it becomes a fantastic example of Earth life's sheer adaptability. It gives us a grounded framework for studying life's limits, both here and potentially elsewhere. This isn't just about debunking. It's about building a more robust scientific understanding of what life can do. Knowing the extremes Earth life can handle helps us know what to look for or what its absence might mean out there. It forces us to ask, what else is terrestrial life capable of that we haven't even documented yet? Okay, I see that point, and I absolutely agree that understanding extremophiles and applying terrestrial analogies is fundamental to good science, especially astrobiology. But let me offer a slightly different perspective on its value here. The very process of rigorously investigating this, trying to rule out the alien possibility, even if we end up confirming it's just fungi, that process itself is incredibly valuable. That intense scrutiny sharpens our methods, our criteria for identifying genuine extraterrestrial life if and when we ever encounter it. Discussing radiotropism specifically because it's on a meteorite 
forces us to think about life's adaptability in the broadest possible sense, here on Earth, yes, but also potentially elsewhere in the cosmos, where maybe similar irradiated conditions exist on other planets, moons, asteroids. It's not just about validating Earth life, it's about stretching our conception of what life could be anywhere. And furthermore, the public fascination, even the fear surrounding claims like this, even if they turn out to be misinterpretations, that reflects a deep, fundamental human curiosity about our place in the universe. And we as scientists or critical thinkers need to address that curiosity with both skepticism, absolutely, but also with genuine open-mindedness. We need to ensure our methods are sharp enough to tell the difference between the truly extraordinary and the merely unusual. So this debate, even if it lands on a terrestrial explanation, helps refine our scientific lens for whatever cosmic discoveries might lie ahead. It teaches us how to ask better, more precise questions. So wrapping up, in light of our discussion, this viral story from Panama, the alien-like entity on the meteorite, while it's definitely captivating and it raises good questions, I believe it's best understood within the framework of known terrestrial biology. The historical pattern of, well, human error and sometimes hype, combined with a very clear, plausible scientific explanation involving radiotrophic fungi and their known behavior, especially radiotropism seen in places like Chernobyl, points strongly towards a natural Earth-based phenomenon. For me, this demonstrates the power, the utility, of seeking terrestrial explanations first for things that seem extraordinary. It actually deepens our appreciation for life's incredible resilience and adaptability right here on our own planet. This case reminds us that often, the most amazing discoveries are found in truly understanding the wonders, even the extremes of our own world. I would frame the takeaway slightly differently. While, yes, the scientific explanation involving radiotrophic fungi offers a compelling and maybe even the most likely account for the growth on that meteorite, and we absolutely must acknowledge the history of hoaxes and mistakes, the unique factor remains. The growth happens on an object with a clear extraterrestrial origin. That keeps a distinct dimension open in this discussion, I think. The specific venom-like description the one that apparently fueled so much public speculation about aliens, still warrants a thorough scientific look, a close examination of its actual morphology beyond just immediate classification. This whole debate really highlights the critical need for rigorous, open-minded scientific inquiry to truly distinguish between incredible terrestrial adaptations and the potential, however small, for genuinely novel extraterrestrial interactions or even just novel biological interactions with extraterrestrial material. Ultimately, it deepens our appreciation for both the sheer adaptability of life as we know it, and for that persistent human drive to understand where we fit in the cosmos. It pushes us to refine our tools and our thinking for whatever we might find next.